Hello, uh, I'm Trent Brown. Welcome to this Tokyo College webinar. So it's a pleasure to introduce today Dr. Michael Keane, who's our uh, Oshioto Fellow at Tokyo College, uh, who will be based here with us until July 2023. So Michael is an economist who served as Deputy Director of Fiscal Affairs at the International Monetary Fund, where he was based for more than 20 years. During that time, he shaped the IMF's policies and advice in relation to his special area of expertise and interest, which is taxation policy. Before that, he was professor of economics at the University of Essex in the United Kingdom. Uh, he's written many academic papers and books on economic policy matters. Uh, his most recent book, Rebellion, Rascals and Revenues, written with Joel Slemrod, uh, is written in a humorous and accessible style to convey basic tax principles to a broad audience. He's also written a paper especially relevant to, the, to today's topic, a 2022 co-authored paper in the journal Fiscal Studies on Border Carbon Adjustments. So uh, I direct interested listeners to that paper where they can learn more about today's topic. Um, today, he'll be talking about border carbon adjustments, including uh, the general themes that are raised in that paper, but he'll also be reflecting on the specific case of the European Union, which has just, I believe, a few days ago, uh, legislated the world's first border carbon adjustment. So it's a very timely topic. Um, also joining us today is Professor Kameyama Yasuko from the Graduate School of Frontier Sciences at the University of Tokyo will be offering her reflections on the themes that Dr. Keane introduces in his presentation. After receiving uh, Professor Kamiyama's comments, we'll then open up to questions from the audience. And I'd advise that uh, you can submit your questions at any time by pressing the Q&A button on your screen. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Michael. Well, thanks very much, Trent. And uh, let me uh, share my screen. So yes, so it's um, a great pleasure. Thanks everybody for, for joining us today. Um, so the topic uh, that I'm gonna be introducing is uh, carbon border adjustment. Uh, it's not a very thrilling title, um, but uh, I'm here partly to persuade you that it is uh, certainly understandable. It sounds rather nerdy, complicated. Basic idea is very simple. So my first task is to convince anybody who needs convincing that uh, that's the case. But also then to persuade you that the topic is both interesting and important. Um, of course, that's topics aren't always interesting and important. For an academic, it's good to find topics that are both interesting and important. So I want to convince you that that's the case for uh, the topic of carbon border adjustment. And in a way, over the last few years, it has moved a little bit from being interesting but not very important. Um, so people like me were writing uh, academic -y papers on this a decade or so ago, at which point there really didn't see much prospect of this happening in, in reality. But now it's becoming important because, as Trent has already mentioned, uh, the EU is in the process of introducing really the world's first uh, national level carbon border adjustment scheme. So now it's interesting and it's important uh, as well. It's also, as the title of the talk is intended to suggest, um, quite a contentious topic. Um, so I'm trying to highlight the contrasting views that on the one hand, some people see border carbon adjustment as important progress, as really essential if the world is to deal with climate change in an efficient and effective way. So for those people, carbon border adjustment is real progress. Other people, on the other hand, see carbon border adjustment as a peril in the sense of holding risks to the wider trading system uh, of the world. So we have the progress or peril uh, issue to address. I have to say, I'm probably rather more on the progress side than on the peril side, um, but I'm not really trying to persuade you of that. I just want to persuade you it's interesting and, and important. And I should say, when I say I'm in favor of progress and that the issue is contentious, that even I think my own views have changed on the topic really even since uh, since we wrote the paper that uh, as Trent mentioned, this talk is based on. And I may say something about that as we, as we go through. So let's turn to the presentation itself. And so here's the, uh, the outline. <clears throat> so we're on the right, you see a, a rather fuzzy and unattractive uh, image of the front page of the article uh, on which the um, paper is, is based. You see the reference at the bottom. 
and it's all open access. So if you're interested, that's easy to, to download. So first of all, I'm going to talk about <clears throat> really just explaining what a carbon border adjustment is. What is all this fuss about? Then, well, why would you ever want to have a border carbon adjustment? What are the objectives that it might serve? And then finally turn to some of the, the key kind of issues around the implementation and design of a carbon border adjustment. Because as we'll see, even though I think the basic idea of carbon border adjustment is very straightforward, there's a lot of important detail uh, around the edges um, that we need to take account of, and that may influence our views uh, as to how sensible movement towards a carbon border adjustment mechanism is. So that's the outline. So to make a start then, well, what is what actually do we mean by a carbon border adjustment? Well, before I get to that, I need to take a little bit of a step back and talk a little bit about carbon pricing and the mitigation of climate change. Mitigation meaning the reduction of CO2 emissions that are one of the main uh, causes of the build of the greenhouse gases, global warming, so on and so forth. So the question is, how is the world efficiently and effectively going to set about reducing carbon emissions? Well, economists have a very clear kind of prescription for this, um, which is carbon pricing. So this is the economist's preferred way to mitigate, that is to reduce carbon emissions. Um, I'll come back to how you might do that. But the idea is that, well, just as we tax uh, other things that we think cause societal damage, cigarettes or alcohol, so we should tax the root cause of carbon emissions. That is the use of carbon, fossil fuels in particular, in production processes. So the idea, excuse me, is that as we simply take the view that we should, since uh, carb emitting carbon causes damage to the, to the, to the uh, global society, we should impose a tax on it to try to induce people to emit rather, rather less. And it's a very simple prescription. It's um, in some sense, it's not kind of very interesting point from an economist point of view, because it's such an obvious point to make. And in fact, I think if you were to um, ask what are the policy prescriptions that economists of all political persuasions agree with, right-wing economists, left-wing economists, they would pretty much all agree that the way to go about reducing emissions is through carbon pricing. And carbon pricing has the merit that, for example, what is an alternative to carbon pricing? An alternative is to say to different firms and different industries, you're only allowed to emit this much carbon in your production processes. That is a, a form of regulation to say we have these standards of how much emission is allowed in producing your product. You can't violate those standards. Well, that kind of doesn't necessarily imply that firms will, in aggregate, reduce emissions in the most effective way because they all face different uh, differing kinds of constraints. The, the constraints will differ in how severe they are, how costly they are to meet them. Whereas if you put a single price on all uses of carbon, that's going to effectively immediately ensure that everybody faces the same cost of reducing carbon emissions, and therefore you end up reducing the total emissions at the least cost in terms of the kind of disruption to production that, um, that is caused by reducing emissions. So compared, for example, to regulation, economists would see this as a far more efficient, far more effective way to set about reducing uh, carbon emissions. You can do that basically in either of two ways. You can do that, as I was just saying, uh, assuming by a tax, that is you have a, simply a tax that's related to how much carbon uh, is emitted in a production process, or you can do it by what's called a cap and trade scheme. So a cap and trade scheme, instead of saying, as a tax does, here's a price, you can emit whatever you want. A cap and trade scheme says, our economy, we're only going to emit a certain amount of carbon emissions. And in order to emit, companies will have to buy licenses. They will effectively trade in licenses um, for the fixed amount of emissions that's allowed. Both of those are ways of establishing a price for carbon. Uh, either an explicit tax or a price of the licenses you have to buy. And we can talk about this more later, but roughly speaking, those are equivalent uh, and they have an equivalent effect on incentives and also on government revenue, so long as you don't give the auction uh, rights away for free. But basically think of those as equivalent measures, tax or cap and trade. So given that economists are pretty unanimous that this is the way to go in terms of reducing carbon emissions in an effective, efficient way, 
you might think, well, surely out there in the world, countries are implementing this unanimous recommendation of economists. Well, sadly, that's not the case. Uh, carbon pricing remains actually very limited uh, in almost all countries. So the chart on the right, on the bottom axis, it's the proportion of greenhouse gas emissions in a country that are covered by some kind of uh, carbon, uh, carbon pricing. And on the uh, horizontal, on the vertical axis is the actual carbon price. So the, the further you are to the top right of that scheme, the more coverage you have and the higher the price. So you can see right at the top right hand corner is Sweden, which has a high carbon price, covers a lot of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions in Sweden. Uh, out of interest, you might ask, where is Japan in this uh, chart? And you can stare at it for quite a long time before seeing right down in the right hand bottom corner, you see Japan, which does have a carbon tax um, and has quite extensive coverage, uh, as you will see, but is at a very low level, very, very minimal carbon tax. I think the last time I looked, it was around 300 yen uh, per ton of CO2, when the price in the EU, for example, now is around 100 euros for a ton of CO2. So 300 yen versus 100 euros. Um, that's the kind of difference we're talking about. So carbon pricing uh, sadly remains rather limited. Um, for these countries here in this, uh, in this slide, you can see that the average price is about $20, uh, I think that is, per ton of CO2. That's just the average for the countries that have some kind of scheme. If you look at the world as a whole, the average is about $2 per ton. So the world is way off having what economists would think of as sensible carbon pricing. And just to give a sense of what sensible carbon pricing might mean, um, most people would say that something like $100, 100 euros a ton by 2030 is a kind of a reasonable start. So there's a lot of diversity out there, a lot of low prices. We can talk about why it is that countries are so reluctant, it seems, to engage in carbon pricing. But one aspect of that to, to mention, uh, because it will come up again, is what economists call the free rider problem. Um, that is, we all kind of know that the world collectively has to address uh, climate change. However, addressing it is going to be costly because we're going to have to change production patterns, consumption patterns to emit less. And basically, everybody would prefer that somebody else bears the cost of addressing climate change. So that's what economists call the free rider problem. Everybody essentially wants if somebody else to bear the cost of reducing emissions. So basically, nobody does uh, as much as they should. So we'll come back to this free rider problem lately. Anyway, so here's the carbon pricing, uh, why it's important. And that brings us on to um, the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism story. So, oh, let me go back. Sorry. So what, what is carbon border adjustment? So a carbon border adjustment is simply a charge on the carbon content of imports that is intended to basically level the playing field between the imported good and domestic production. So you're trying to put a charge on your imports to make sure that imports are treated in the same way as your producers are when they produce that same good. So it's intended to ensure everybody is treated Who's, who's, who's selling in your country, everybody is treated in the same way in terms of carbon pricing. So that's for imports. We'll have to come back to the question of how do you deal with exports. There's a question of whether you should then rebate, refund, give back the carbon tax on your exports. So we'll come back to that. So just there's an example on the right, which may help to explain what we're talking about. So suppose we're the EU and we presume, and I'll come back to what presume means, we have a, a ton of steel being imported and we think that generates about one and a half tons of CO2. I'm just making these numbers up, of course. And let's suppose the exporting country has a carbon tax of $20 per ton, whereas we, the EU, the importing country, we have a carbon tax of $80 per ton. What is the charge going to be then? Well, we're going to look at the difference between the carbon price or tax in the home country, the 80, the carbon tax abroad of 20, which is the difference of 60. So we're going to charge $60 per ton of uh, imported steel, uh, which is going to be give us this $90 on a ton of uh, imported steel, the $60 difference times the 1.5 tons of CO2, which is the base on which this charge is going to be levied. So that's the basic idea of a carbon border adjustment, which as I say is fairly straightforward. 
<clears throat> why does this kind of become important? Well, you can see it becomes very important when differences in carbon prices vary a lot between countries. So if you're the EU and you're looking at, well, my producers have a carbon price of 100 uh, euros a ton, you're looking at other countries where the, where the carbon tax may be minimal, you're going to think, well, hang on, this isn't quite right. Uh, this dispersion of carbon prices is problematic. It's problematic for my producers. It's problematic in other ways that we're going to talk about. So carbon board adjustment becomes relevant when carbon prices differ across countries. It's this dispersion across countries that really matters. And if you think back to the, the previous slide, you see how, if you look kind of down the vertical axis, you see how big these price differences are. So carbon border pricing, carbon border adjustment becomes rather important. And as Trent mentioned, as we've heard, um, one of the reasons this is becoming important is because the EU is now in the process of introducing the world's first national level um, carbon border adjustment. There is a kind of a, a state level one in California um, to do with electricity, but this is the first kind of serious national, uh, well, sort of super and super national uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism. It's beginning in the sense now of having companies report on carbon content of their, of their, of their, of their goods. Um, charging will begin from 2026. The UK is also looking into uh, introducing a carbon border adjustment, possibly from 2026. So this is becoming a kind of a real, a real thing. So as I was saying at the outset, it's moved from being of interest uh, to theoreticians to something that's actually pretty becoming pretty important. So to the second part, why would you ever want to have uh, a border carbon adjustment of some kind? Well, <clears throat> there are three traditional reasons. Uh, one kind of the most obvious is to preserve the competitiveness of your domestic industries in your domestic uh, and in international markets. That is an example I was giving before, if you're importing steel, um, you don't, you're going to be slightly unhappy if your domestic producers are being disadvantaged relative to foreign producers by facing a lower carbon tax. So it's kind of to, to level the, <clears throat> the, the playing field in terms of competitiveness uh, between um, uh, producers from different uh, jurisdictions, between producers facing high and low carbon prices. And <clears throat> in this way, um, it can also help to overcome to some extent that free rider problem. Because one of the kind of reasons countries uh, would prefer other people to do the hard business, the hard lift of carbon pricing is, well, they worry that if we increase our carbon prices, essentially all that's going to happen is that business is going to move abroad. Um, that will then make us less inclined to raise our carbon prices. So by insulating the kind of domestic firms from the competitiveness impact of carbon pricing, the hope is that, well, perhaps carbon border adjustment can also lead countries to be more aggressive in the carbon prices, carbon taxes, cap and trade, however implemented, be more ambitious in the carbon prices they can impose. That is, the EU may feel freer to raise the, uh, to tighten its emission trading standards if it uh, understands that because of the border carbon adjustment, it's going to disadvantage its own firms rather less than otherwise. So that's... Um, uh, a key aspect of this. We get quickly into some of the kind of details of implementation. Who are we actually going to uh, um, apply this adjustment to? And here attention really focuses very quickly on a few key sectors, sectors that are energy intensive and are trade exposed. The EITI activities, things like iron, plastic, cements, aluminium, electricity, these are what are called the EITI sectors, and that's where the focus is in terms of at least the first stage of applying a carbon border adjustment mechanism. In terms of their importance, <clears throat> you can see uh, the chart on the right shows that, well, actually, um, typically, the blue line, uh, these sectors account for maybe sort of 10 to 30 percent of national emissions. So not 100 percent by any means, uh, but a, a sizable proportion, 10, 30 percent. Um, Non-EITI manufacturing, uh, which is the green bar, accounts for much smaller. So within manufacturing, the EITEs account for a lot of emissions, but in the wider scheme of things, a lot of emissions are not from the EITIs, but they may be from things like 
domestic transport, domestic buildings that don't raise the same cross-border issues. Anyway, that's where attention focuses on these sectors. A second objective is to limit what's called leakage. That is, the, you, countries can be aware that if they re reduce their emissions at home, well, maybe what's going to happen is that firms are going to move abroad to where the carbon price is lower, or maybe um, countries will, or consumers will import from uh, countries where the carbon price is lower, and hence the final price of the good is lower. And so what would happen is that while well, we reduce emissions at home, but actually emissions go up abroad, firms move there, or production there that generates emissions goes up. So there's a concern that, uh, that aggressive measures in one country will uh, cause leakage of this kind, and carbon border adjustment to some extent can um, limit that effect, because, for example, it will negate any possibility that consumers will buy instead from producers that face lower carbon prices, because, well, they may face lower carbon prices abroad, but that's going to be corrected when we import them. So it kind of removes that risk of leakage. How important uh, leakage is um, does depend on policies abroad. Um, you might think, for example, that, well, surely um, the, uh, the kind of a Paris Agreement means countries have a binding cap on their emissions, in which case, if, if, if countries have binding limits on emissions, then really this leakage thing won't work because uh, emissions abroad can't go up if they're capped. However, um, in practice, that's not really the case. Many countries don't have binding emission caps. They're not binding, or they may be uh, related to GDP or in some other way that they don't actually bind. So we can't, we can't rule out the limit, the leakage uh, possibility through that route. In terms of empirical evidence, it's quite mixed on how important leakage is. Past studies often find leakage is like 10, 30%, meaning that if a country reduces emissions by one ton, then emissions elsewhere go up by 10 to 30 percent of that, so the reduction is only for one ton redu reduction at, at home, translates into a 70 or 90 percent uh, emission, uh, 70 percent emissions cut globally. Uh, however, more recent work actually finds much larger emission figures. Some put it at an average of 25 percent, so that's quite a lot. So that does suggest that emissions can be, or the leakage of emissions is a real concern, and one argument for border carbon adjustment is to try and prevent that happening or at least to limit the extent to which it can happen. Uh, a third objective is to kind of encourage other countries to, do, to adopt carbon pricing themselves. And the argument here is simply, well, suppose you're exporting to the EU, and now you notice that when you export to the EU, there's a tax being imposed on those exports related to the carbon content. Well, <clears throat> hang on. Rather than have somebody else collect the revenue, why don't you impose that tax yourself the producer doesn't care because they're going to pay the tax anyway, but if you impose the tax yourself, you're going to get the money. So the argument is that in this way, there's an incentive for other countries to introduce carbon pricing too, be more aggressive in their carbon pricing. How important that is, however, depends on really how important uh, for these foreign countries, for exporters, how large a share of their emissions will be subject to a border carbon adjustment abroad. And what the picture on the on the right shows, for example, is that if we just had a carbon adjustment in uh, the EU, so we're looking at the at the brown, uh, sorry, at the blue space, really it's not a very big deal. If you look at China, that would mean that kind of less than something about one percent of their exports would be subject to a kind of a topping up tax in uh, in the EU, which is not a huge incentive for China to put a tax on the other ninety nine percent in order to recover the 1% on the uh, exports that do get topped up. So I think you can say this is probably a somewhat limited uh, argument in terms of its force. So those are kind of the three main arguments, uh, which you may like or you may not like for some form of carbon board adjustment. But let's just say a little bit about what some of the issues that arise when we move from the kind of very generalized ideas I've just been describing to, uh, to something like practice. Well, how much revenue might this whole thing raise? Um, well, it depends on a whole mass of detail. But for example, the EU scheme uh, has been put at around a billion euros by the end of the 2020s, which is, you know, it's about 0.1% of GDP, which is not in some sense huge. But for example, relative to the EU budget, that is certainly an amount of money worth having. 
And that's why it is to, it's sometimes suggested that this money be used by the EU as what's called an own resource, that is something to finance the activities of the union itself. Um, let me skip over that slide. And then I think one important issue to talk about here is, well, what do you do about exports? So far, I've really focused very much on imports. Well, um, in fact, the EU scheme simply has a tax on imports. There's no kind of rebate <clears throat> or emission on exports. But you could certainly argue that there should be one. You can argue that on competitiveness grounds. That is, if your producers are producing at home are facing a higher carbon price than their competitors in world markets, then competitiveness concerns, at least, would suggest that you rebate, you rebate or refund the tax on your producers when they export into world markets. Uh, you could also argue on leakage grounds that if, nonetheless, your production is actually cleaner than abroad, uh, then why disadvantage it by imposing this higher carbon tax when it competes in world markets? You might want to, even on leakage grounds, you might want to make your products cheap in world markets by rebating the carbon tax when they're exported. Now, of course, what, how you treat exports make a lot, makes a large difference to revenue because on the import side, you're always going to be collecting money because there's always going to be some carbon content in your imports. Exports, you're going to be giving some money away because there's always going to be some carbon content. So where you end up uh, overall, as between the money on the imports, the money you give away on the exports, depends on essentially your net trade in carbon emissions. So for the, for the EU, for example, we find that uh, even with an export rebate, giving the money back, you have less revenue than you do if you don't give the export rebate, but nonetheless, revenue is still positive. On the other hand, China, which is a large, in effect, export of carbon, the reverse is true. There, there would be a, a net loss of uh, net loss of revenue from a carbon border adjustment that rebated on exports as well as collected on imports. <clears throat> to finish briefly by just going some through some other kind of big issues, <clears throat> um, talked a little bit about coverage. Said there's a strong case for beginning with the EITs. Well, yes, and that's really what the EU scheme does, but it's clear that there's a strong case for expanding the scheme over time to include a wider range of emissions. Also, the second bullet, um, at the moment, the scheme only covers what are kind of direct emissions, emissions under the direct control of the firm that's doing the exporting, for example. Um, and again, that's kind of a practical way to do it. But the logic also says that you should be taking account of the indirect emissions, that is the emissions embodied in the inputs that are used by the exporter, not just the inputs, uh, not just the energy directly used by the uh, exporter themselves. Again, of course, that imposes stronger uh, information verification requirements. There's a big issue, thirdly, of whether you use the, whether in terms of, uh, <clears throat> that, think about that example I gave, where we said a, a ton of steel had 1.5 tons of CO2. Do we take that 1.5 from what's the production patterns at home or from the production patterns abroad. And that's going to make quite a large difference to some countries that have really relatively uh, dirty production methods, um, typically emerging or low-income countries. There's a big issue whether you use foreign or, or, or domestic carbon intensity. What do you do for developing least developed countries? Um, particularly, there can be a contrast, an, an issue that in some sense, maybe you want to not uh, be so harsh in the carbon border adjustment uh, scheme to developing countries or low-income countries. But what do you do if those low-income countries are actually large emitters? Well, yeah, we're then going to have a conflicting uh, objectives or conflicting concerns. And then <clears throat> lastly, um, there's a question about how you deal with non-price measures abroad. And I think this is a big uh, question, both intellectually and I think practically, because essentially for what now we've been uh, going through things has been as if countries are using carbon prices of various kinds, but at very different levels, as in that first scheme. But what do you do if a country does not uh, impose a carbon price, but has some kind of regulatory or other measures that uh, are intended to reduce emissions and to reduce emissions intensity? Well, in some sense, it's for, for those producers, regulation is as if you face the shadow price, that, a, a kind of artificial price. So your decisions are the same as if you uh, faced uh, what economists call a shadow price. That is an artificial price that led you to cut emissions to whatever the level the regulatory standards uh, imply. Uh, 
However, um, that shadow price does not become a real increase in costs. Um, it's just an as if price. So it doesn't increase uh, private, uh, private costs. So you could still make an argument for a border carbon adjustment on competitiveness grounds, um, but it's becoming much less clear cut, I think, as we look about at the need to deal with non-price measures, because non-price measures, in effect, um, impose an increase in costs on foreign producers, but not in the same way that an explicit tax would. A third issue is, uh, well, not, whatever, penultimate issue is, what do we do about um, taxes that are not actually explicitly called carbon taxes and are not carbon taxes in the sense of applying at a uniform rate to all carbon emissions. So many countries, uh, including Japan, for example, have taxes on coal, taxes on fuel. They look like carbon prices, but they're not on all carbon emissions. Um, so there's a question how you would treat those in uh, relation to carbon border adjustment. And I think the EU approach is to say, as I understand it, that they don't count unless they're actually kind of well-designed carbon prices across the board, uh, they're not going to be accepted as, uh, as, um, uh, as reducing the charge that would be a, a chargeable on imports. And then finally, um, and uh, I'm an economist, not a lawyer, but there are a whole set of legal issues as to whether carbon border adjustment uh, would be acceptable under uh, World Trade Organization rules. Um, there's a huge literature on that, but the bottom line is that really nobody will quite know until somebody introduces a carbon border adjustment mechanism, as the EU is, and somebody decides to challenge it to the WTO. So it's not a question we can answer in, in theory, but it's a very much a kind of a, a, a going to be a, a, a question that is sorted out uh, in the uh, legal process. So with that, let me thank you for your uh, patience and uh, looking forward to chatting more and hoping to have gone some way to persuading you both of the interest and of the importance. So thank you very much. Back to Trent, I believe. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael, for that very eloquent and persuasive presentation. Um, we're going to hand over now to Professor uh, Kamiyama Yasuko, who is uh, joining us on Zoom. Uh, Professor Kamiyama is uh, based at the Graduate School of Frontier Sciences at the University of Tokyo, and her work is in the, the field of sustainability sciences. Uh, her research focuses on international cooperation regarding climate change, and the development of reliable sustainability indicators. Um, so Professor Kamiyama, we're very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts on uh, Professor Keane's presentation. Thank you, Trent, and uh, good evening um, to all the listeners. Um, my name is Yasuko Kamiyama, and uh, um, I would like to thank um, the Tokyo College for hosting such an excellent um, webinar and uh, uh, inviting me to make a comment. Uh, Michael's presentation was very interesting. And uh, oh, because I myself, my background is international relations, I won't be able to make uh, very professional comments, um, perhaps like from those from uh, economist or lawyer, but uh, I would like to make some general comments. So let me share my screen. My general comment is really that the presentation was very excellent and it was comprehensive overview of feature of carbon border adjustment as well as assessment for the design. I fully agree to the arguments in general, but at the same time, I would like to make some points for further discussion. And when I make um, further discussion, I'm, my idea is mainly based on the actual uh, debates which are going on um, uh, in terms of CBAM um, of the EU, European Union. So main objectives and metrics for assessment of carbon border adjustment designs, um, I believe Michael has raised three major uh, objectives to introduce um, carbon border adjustment. First is to maintain competitiveness of domestic industries. I also agree that this is the most um, important 
primary objective to introduce uh, carbon border adjustment. But um, in addition to that, uh, when we see what's going on in European Union right now, is that um, it should it may also include some additional um, objectives. Um, it is um, interna internal political reasons. Introduction of carbon border adjustment is a way to convince carbon intensive industries in the region that are currently exempted from emission trading scheme to, to accept the scheme. What I mean by this is that currently because the EU ETS emissions trading scheme has only been introduced at the regional level, um, some major energy intensive industries in the regions are partially exempted or, or, or um, the emission allowances are uh, given almost free of charge to those industries. And those industries have always argued that if they are to be covered uh, by the emissions trading schemes in the region, then they would like to have this carbon border adjustment. So, um, so in order for the European Union to convince those industries in the region, they want they had to have this um, carbon adjustment mechanisms. So I, I would like to uh, emphasize this point. The second uh, objective which was raised was to limit leakage. And uh, um, I think Michael also was not sure if the CBA was perfectly effective for limiting leakages. And the paper he wrote um, argued that the Paris Agreement, which mandates all countries to set emission targets, is the instrument that limit leakages. And I fully agree to this argument. Um, but I would also like to uh, um, give some ad additional information to the listeners that um, the, the, how much leakage might um, be caused or limited by CBAM has been dealt by so many studies. There are many studies tackling this specific topic and that they include those using CGE GTAP models. This is the kind of trading models or the input output models. And also in recent years, uh, a new method called structural gravity analysis has been quite popular to analyze how much leakage could occur based on this uh, carbon border adjustment uh, uh, instruments. And um, just for example, this is a map that I've um, downloaded from a, a document um, from Global Steel Trade Monitor. Uh, this was published in 2019, so it was it's published before the the Russian Ukraine war started. But at least at that time, the Europe European Union imported steel from these countries, which are in big circles, Russia, Ukraine, Turkey, South Korea, China, and Brazil. And my, my question is, when the CBAM is to be introduced in the EU, where would those steel go? Some of the steel will continue to flow into European Union, even if the, they are being taxed. But at the same time, I'm quite sure that there are many other countries in the world outside the European Union that might increase the, uh, the production using the steel which are produced in those countries which are uh, which have, have, have less carbon pricing. And it depends on those countries outside the European Union how they are going to uh, um, uh, deal with the, the steel which are being produced in these countries. Are they going to increase the uh, demand steel or is it the, the producing countries that are going to decrease the, the level of production? This is the kind of questions that are being uh, um, dealt by uh, many studies in recent years. And I think those studies are going to be quite important when we assess the, 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 the influence of CBAM. 
The third um, main objective is to encourage carbon pricing elsewhere, and perhaps yes, but there could be other ways to promote carbon pricing. And uh, my, my comments continues, um, as been shown in the, the slides by the speaker, the devil is in the details. So there are still so many other um, issues we need to discuss when we actually start the, the, the implementation of, of um, CBAM. So I will not uh, read out these bullet points because they are already being given, but I think each of those bullet points are going to be quite uh, heavy <laughs> if we we are really going to see um, how the, the mechanism is going to be introduced. And the secondly, could have um, conflicts with WTO rules. And this is also another area where you find so many article um, journal papers, um, mainly from a legal aspect. And what I hear from many legal, legal experts is that the CBAM could actually be in conflict with the WTO rules. Um, it, now we don't see it just because the countries are not trying to challenge, and especially um, currently the US uh, is under the Biden administration, which is basically supportive of this um, uh, CBAM, but we're not be sure if some other uh, Republican administration comes in future years. So I would like to just leave it here because I am not an ex expert on, uh, uh, from legal perspective, but um, this is still a big issue, I think. So my questions, now I have two um, questions. One is consequences to global emissions. How much could EU CBAM affect the world to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, taking into account the point, all the points raised um, in the lecture today? Coverage of mechanisms or level of carbon leakage, as well as promotion of carbon pricing outside the regions are particularly relevant to, to my, my question. Well, in reality, and how would the CBAM affect the global emission? This is my first question. The second question is effective use of business sectors initiative. Because um, basically when you um, explain something about CBAM, you're only talking about the national or EU regional level uh, legislation. However, in recent years, there are so many activities going on in a non-state actors level, especially business sectors level. So engaging CBA with business sectors movements could be effective in promoting carbon pricing both inside and outside the region, and as well as to reduce leakages. So putting together those regional level legislation with what's going on in non-state actors movement could become quite effective in reducing the, the, the global um, um, emissions. So ESG uh, initiatives such as TCFD, Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures or ESG Investments and Sustainable Financing motivate pro private companies to purchase and sell less carbon intensive products. I would be interested in hearing the speaker's view on this perspective. So this is it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kameyama Sensei, for uh, raising those very important issues and questions. Um, Michael, did you have a response? Um, yeah, sure. No, thank you, Asuka. Very nice, uh, very expert questions, if I may say. So thanks very much. Um, a few thoughts. I mean, maybe just to pick up some of your earlier points as well. First, I think just on the on the leakage point, I mean, I, I uh agree that the, the empirical issue I, my reading is kind of quite mixed people use different methods some are these simulation things some are based on past experience of carbon prices some are more general quite different results it seems to me there's also i think one route one form of leakage that we haven't uh, uh, touched on which carbon board adjustment doesn't really help which is that if you say reduce the demand for fossil fuels in the eu that reduces presumably the world price of fossil fuels that leads to more emissions somewhere else so there's also another whole route that carbon board adjustment doesn't do anything uh, about, about that um so uh the, so i think the, the leakage issue is quite complicated i think shown too by your steel example uh 
where I think, you know, it, it's a very nice example. I mean, I, I think it shows a lot of things matter. It matters whether you're just dealing with direct emissions or whether you include indirect emissions. It depends who's doing the border carbon adjustment. I mean, if goods are flowing through everybody doing the border carbon adjustment, then it's not a problem. You have to worry about rules of origin and, you know, this kind of shifting or shuffling of, of who does the who does the exporting within the kind of vertically integrated business. So there are all, there are all kinds of, um, I think it's a very nice example to point out that, you know, these practical issues, these design details really do matter quite a lot. And I guess that's might be my answer to your first question. Do we know how much the carbon border adjustment will reduce um, emissions that you want? I, I don't want to put, I certainly don't want to, to put a number on it. But again, it's worth remembering that, you know, the carbon border adjustment is, is the secondary measure. I mean, the primary measure is the domestic carbon pricing. So the primary measure is the carbon pricing in the EU, it seems to me. And that's where we look for the reduction in emissions is through that. And the carbon border adjustment is kind of a, I think is a secondary thing. I mean, it, the view, the argument is whether it's a help, you know, how helpful it is. But I think we also have to remember that carbon border adjustment is, is kind of not, comes back to the legal thing about the legal issue too. Carbon border adjustment is not really um, disadvantaging other countries. The carbon border adjustment is removing a disadvantage that the carbon pricing country is putting on itself. So I think we always have to come back to, well, the carbon border adjustment is just a complement to the main kind of, um, it's the side dish to the main meal, which is the carbon, which is the domestic carbon pricing, it seems to me. Um, so on, uh, on, the, on the legalities, um, yeah, we could say a little bit more on that, but I, I agree. Um, views views differ, but again, I think as you say, it doesn't. You know, we can have thousands of papers, but till it comes to the WTO, we don't really know how. And the WTO is not in the best of all states, as I understand at the moment. Um, business initiatives, yes, they're very good, and in some ways, there are there are businesses that are quite advanced, uh, quite serious about carbon pricing, but really i'm not i'm not going to put the future of the world in the goodwill of profit maximizing companies that's just at the end of the day the end of the day i think some element of compulsion uh, is needed because basically there, there we have this free riding the whole free riding problem i don't think we are going to get around this very profound fundamental uh, free riding problem by however well-intentioned, uh, and I'm sure many of them are through uh, pure business initiatives. Business have to do things that they don't want to do at some point, but that would be my quick response. So, but they're great points. Very, thank you. Thanks very much. All good things. I'll need to think about a bit more. Um, we do have uh, a couple of questions in the Q&A, though oh, I, would, oh, okay. um, I would encourage uh, people to submit any questions that they may have using the, the Q&A button on your screen. Um, I might actually start by asking a question of my own, which mm -hmm. relates to one of the questions in the Q&A, which is whether there is any uh, notion of historical responsibility mm -hmm. built into the EU's policy, um, some sort of exemption for poor countries who historically have only made small contributions to global greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, the question, the Q&A that's uh, sort of related to this is from uh, Tan Hua Yun, who says, in dealing with the large emission from underdeveloped countries, currently, is there any mechanism which aims to promote developed countries to offer decarbonization support for those underdeveloped countries? If not, is it possible that such mechanisms will be discussed amongst governments in future? Uh -huh. Oh, thank you. No, there's a big, big set of issues on um, dealing with um, developing countries and low, low emitting countries in particular. I mean, I think there's a uh, would be a widespread uh, intention to take account, particularly of, of the low income countries. I think there are actually going back to the point we we're just talking about. There, there are some legal issues about how you do that. Um, that's consistent with WTOs. I think for what's called the least developed countries. I think that's that that can clearly be done, but I think there are these kind of various non-discrimination rules that can potentially get in the way of that. And I, I know that there's some, there has been some talk that perhaps when the EU imposes uh, the the carbon border adjustment in relation to goods from low-income countries, perhaps the revenue should not go should go not to the EU but it, but to the developing countries themselves. I'm not sure how far that's got, but it, there's no. There's no explicit allowance for a historical responsibility. I think there is a, a recognition um, that uh, there are particular issues for, for lower income countries. And I think it also comes up 
for example, this issue of, well, what, um, <clears throat> again, it's a sort of technical thing, but I think matters quite a lot for low income countries. You know, do you use the kind of emissions intensity in domestic production to benchmark the carbon board adjustment, or do you use the, uh, the emissions abroad? Um, and in some sense, if you use the emissions in uh, a home, home country, uh, that's going to be rather more um, uh, favorable for, for the low income countries, because low income countries, to the extent they would, they would, they would dirt you in their technologies, that would imply a bigger charge. So there's some thought, well, let's use domestic uh, in, the, in the higher income countries to kind of cut a bit of a break in some sense for low income countries. So I think there are, as far as I know, there are thoughts around, as I think there's a sense in which, yes, there are particular problems for developing countries. I think it turns out empirically, they're not that much affected with kind of, I think, two or three uh, exceptions. People have actually tried to look at specific cases of uh, countries that would be have significant uh, impact, low-income countries. I think there are a couple. Um, I can't remember them now, uh, two or two or three. Um, but uh, I think it's a kind of an, 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 open, an open question. I think the legal issues can complicate things. Um, but the tricky thing, of course, as, as if carbon board adjustment were to become more widespread, is what do you do about low-income countries that are big emitters? And you know, India comes to mind, for example, um, where you could say, well, it's low-income, so it should have a, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, should should be uh, given a bit of a break in terms of these things. But on the other hand, some people would argue that, well, it's a big emitter, and the only way we can deal with that is to reduce emissions there. But then, as you know, people come back and say, well, what about historical responsibility? And then, right. then we get into the issue of trying to make numbers add up in terms of uh, mm -hmm. meeting targets. Mm -hmm. But sorry, I don't, that's the best I can do. On, yeah, on yeah thorny yeah. issues yeah. there. Um, OK, we have a question from Miki Yanagi, who says, uh, could you please tell us what method you use to calculate carbon leakage? Yeah. Well, uh, it's a very simple method, which was to take numbers from OECD, basically, um, who I think you basically you use input, you can get the best input output matrices that you can you can come up with and figure it out from there. So that was a uh, don't claim any uh, responsibility or credit or the opposite for the carbon leakage numbers, I'm afraid. OK, um, we then have. Oh, a hang on. No, no. So I misunderstood. Sorry, I misunderstood. Uh, there's no that well there, there, there are different numbers going and floating on in the paper for leakage but if we mean the numbers about what do we think is the proportion of re emission reduction say in the eu that are offset by increases abroad there's a the, the numbers that we cite come from quite a big literature on that um as we were saying with the ESICO, a big literature that some of which uses kind of econometrics some of which uses simulation methods Many of them come up with quite small numbers, um, but it's some of the more recent work uh, that I was citing that comes up with larger numbers. Uh, and it depends on country size as well and things like that. So if you're a small country, uh, it's more likely that leakage will be, will be uh, high because you probably have a high ratio of exports and imports uh, to, to uh, domestic production. If you're a big country, uh, leakage will probably be uh, smaller. If you're the world as a whole, of course, leakage is zero. So the bigger you are, the, the smaller leakage rates tend to tend to be. Hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, we then have a question. If the free allowance of EU ETS is eliminated, do you expect the carbon price to go up or down? Uh, that's, a kind of, that's a kind of interesting one. I have to sit down and uh, think about that. I think I don't expect anything to happen because if the, the free allowance in principle uh, relates to past emissions, so uh, it's simply a lump sum payment. It's not affected by how many, uh, and it doesn't affect the price you pay at the margin uh, for any extra allowances. So it's kind of like a lump sum. We say, give these, we give these firms, I mean, it's a bit more complicated than this, but <clears throat> primarily to the kind of first order, it's a, it's, a, it's a fixed payment to these particular firms. So that doesn't actually affect the value to them of an additional, uh, buying an additional um, uh, unit that they can emit. Um, because essentially, so long as it's, if, if so long as they're buying uh, rights to emit at the margin, which most of them will be, um, it doesn't make any difference at the margin to their, to their demand for, uh, for um, licenses to emit. Um, that's the marginal effect. If we want to get into it more, you could say, well, maybe there's an intra-marginal effect. Maybe they, um, because that lump sum uh, 
payment, they effectively receive increases their profits, taking it away reduces their profits in, a, in, in operating within the EU. So maybe they'll go somewhere else. I don't know. But uh, so if we, you know, we think about the, the marginal effect, I would say is, is going to be small, close to zero. Couldn't rule out that there's going to be a kind of intramarginal effect of firms moving. But I think that seems pretty unlikely, <laughs> given what we know about what induces firms to change their location, where things like taxes are matter, but are usually quite far down the list. Okay, we don't have any more questions in the Q&A, so um, if nobody else wants to submit one, I might ask a further question, which is, uh, could we perhaps get a bit into the political economy of, uh -huh. of this whole thing? Um, so who would be the main winners and losers from, um, from the EU's uh, new mechanism? And uh, if, if there were to be a legal challenge through the WTO, could you speculate on where it might come from? Right. Um, well, I think the winners and winners and losers. Um, well, I think the EU would say the the primary winners of the world as a whole because we're going to uh, make, take make climate action more more effective. Um, of course, uh, domestic. Well, in some sense, it depends what the reference point is. I suppose the reference point would be that the, the EU imposes a carbon tax but does not border adjust. That's one, you know. That's one reference point. And there, of course, relative to that, um, EU companies would be uh, would be winners. Uh, companies in the rest of the world would tend to be losers. Um, but in some sense, the question becomes what's the relevant, what's the relevant uh, comparison? So there I'm saying a comparison with the carbon pricing, no border adjustment. Maybe the relevant comparison is no carbon pricing and no border adjustment, which I think would give a slightly uh, you know, different, different kind of picture of winners and, and, and losers, um, because that would probably then put the domestic companies amongst the, amongst the losers. But mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, I think it's for the EITIs, it's going to be countries that are relatively intensive in uh, exports of the uh, EITI goods. I um, as I mentioned, I think there are some developing countries where we think there are, or some work suggests there are Losses large enough to be of concern, but you know, not a kind of not a kind of massive destruction uh, in the rest of the world. Um, on on the on the legalities, well, I don't know. I tend to believe the legalities will come down to politics too at the end of the day. But maybe just to elaborate a bit more on what the legal issues are. So there are certainly rules in the WTO that allow a country countries to impose a tax on imports and remit that tax on exports if they do exactly if that's exactly the same treatment they give to domestic companies so that's why for example the value added tax is wto consistent because certainly yes imports are taxed under the vat exports are rebated but it's all the same as for domestic companies so that's perfectly fine uh, so you might think well why is why is a border carbon adjustment different from that well it comes down then to well do we think that the car, that if two products kind of look the same, but they have different carbon embodied in them, uh, do we think they're different products or are they the same product, which becomes a kind of legal thing? Um, so there's a, there's kind of some issues in the application of the same rules that allow the VAT to survive. Um, even if those rules, even if for some rules, um, so those, those rules are kind of pretty much okay if you can prove that you're really treating domestic firms and, in, and foreign firms in exactly the same way for this indirect tax. Um, I think the issue is, well, what, what, does it, what exactly does the same treatment mean, given that you do want to differentiate according to carbon content? So I think that's one set of issues on, the, on the, you know, how far it can be regarded as a VAT-like adjustment. The other one is that there are various, there are various exceptions that are allowed, if I understand correctly, uh, including things like preservation of natural resources, where then you can say, well, okay, let's let's try and push it through on that argument. Um, and that, I think, again, is not quite sorted out whether that argument would work. It may be, for example, that the context in which you adopt the measure will matter. So, for example, um, <clears throat> and what you do with the money may matter. So if you were to impose this, this charge, um, and you were to use the revenue, maybe you know, not to build schools or whatever, but to to finance um, uh, 
mitigation initiatives or something related to environment, then that might look a bit more like you're really doing this for environmental reasons. Um, so there are ways, I think, in which you kind of package things that may matter. So, for example, if you say we're doing the we're doing the border carbon adjustment because we want to encourage other people to do carbon pricing, that might be a no, no, that's not a kind of that's not a WTO consistent reason. So I think as uh, as, as Yasiko says, there's a kind of a huge literature on all this. Um, but really where it plays out, uh, I, I, in legal terms, I don't know. Um, you would imagine that were it to come to court that um, if people were persuaded that this was genuinely a measure that uh, helped the world achieve its uh, climate objectives, then you'd hope that would the economics would have some sway with the lawyers, but the economics doesn't always have the sway with the lawyers that economists would like. Um, okay, uh, we don't have any further questions in the q and A. I wonder, uh, sorry? Oh, there's one. Oh, there is one. Okay. What would be the implications of an incentive creation policy like the US IRA, a violation of the WTO, but also one of implicit CP? Well, that's going to be a big question, I think, when we come to uh, thinking about the, the legality of some of these things. I mean, I think it's, in some sense, the, if, if there are, if you take the competitiveness concern, of course, you worry about subsidies. You would think that subsidies should be corrected uh, through, a, through, a border, through a border adjustment. Uh, leakage is kind of not quite so clear what you want to do. Um, so I, I would... Um, uh, I think that's all I can all I can sort of say about that. I mean, logically, it, it fits within the, the framework that we think about border carbon adjustments. Um, clearly, you know, there may be some WTO consistent uh, issue, some WTO consistency issues there, as I think you in fact note uh, in the question. So it may be interesting to see how those WTO issues play out against the carbon border adjustment issues. But I think, I mean, in some sense, uh, it's the wider issue of non-price measures that I was talking about. Um, how you handle those, which I think is not really completely worked out, to tell the truth. Uh, and the the sub the subsidy as such issue, I think, is kind of easier to easier to to handle. Um, we we that's... then have uh, another question, also related to no. developing countries. Could the carbon border adjustment measure scheme create market distortions by preventing reduction in countries with low abatement costs? For example, developing countries can reduce the emissions if the EU pay for the reduction. Uh, not fully sure I get this one. Um, the EU pays the reduction. You're thinking through, uh, well, maybe it relates to one of the earlier questions I think was up there about schemes that um, uh, developing countries can use to offer decarbonization support. Um, so maybe just to start with going back to that one, which I think was the first question. Yeah, I mean, yes, there are various funds. There's a kind of the Green Climate Fund and, and various things. And there was this old promise uh, through the G20 for uh, advanced countries to come up with $100 billion uh, a year to support both um, uh, mitigation activities and adaptation activities. I think rather more is going on adaptation than, than on mitigation. So there are, um, there are uh, schemes out there by which the developing country, by which uh, the advanced countries, including not least the EU, would help to pay for mitigation activities. I'm not quite sure. I see it how that happens through the uh, through the carbon border adjustment, um, uh, giving back the revenue. I think would be a would be a somewhat different exercise, and uh, not quite sure that would unless it was tied to some reduction in in, uh, in emissions intensity. Perhaps there could be something there. Um, creating market distortions by preventing reduction in countries with low abatement costs i'm not quite sure i don't think i would uh, i would see that i mean incentives to uh in in um if you're a low abatement country and you have nothing to do with the eu then clearly your incentives to abate are unchanged if you're dealing with the eu then your abatement incentives if anything uh would go up uh through the uh, through the eu scheme um because because you're going to be <clears throat> taxed to the extent that you haven't uh, under and haven't exploited your opportunities to abate, which would be true too if your own country imposed the uh, 
the same tax on your exports. So I'm I'm not sure I see the uh, uh, the market distortions, but I may be I may be missing something there. Okay, um, we do seem to be out of questions again. Um, is uh, uh, Kamiyama Sensei, uh, would you have any final uh, reflections you might like to add, or any any further questions? Thank you so much. I, I have been enjoying this conversation. <laughs> um, but thank you once again, um, Professor King. Uh, maybe a simple question from me is about the title of your presentation today is use the word progress or peril. And uh, in what terms are you using those words? Progress of, of what? Of um, EU climate policy or um just general uh climate policy in general or um what what, what how how did you use the word <laughs> well thanks well there's no no great thought there i think it's that um people always put opportunities and challenges in their paper titles and we used to do that every day three times at the imf when i was there so i thought i'd do something different um but i think progress would be well okay here's here's Border carbon adjustment is an idea that's been around for a long time. Uh, no one's really taken it up. So my sense is somebody taking it up seriously, the EU taking it up seriously, is progress towards this uh, increasingly uh, worrying, um, or the failure is increasingly worrying in terms of having a serious mitigation policy. So I'd see it as progress in developing the tools to, to, towards at least a sensible mitigation um, uh policy set of policies um i think the peril is which we didn't actually speak all that much of course it's kind of implicit in much of i think what in your remarks and others is that people worry that carbon border adjustment will just become a a, a vehicle for disguised protectionism that people will say well look, we don't like uh we you know we don't want imports from this country so we're just going to say oh they're terribly dirty these imports from this country and and it, it'll kind of um I suppose violate the kind of general principles that the WTO is is uh, supposed to be protecting. So I think the the fear has always been that you can't do the kind of verification that you that you mentioned quite rightly uh, with sufficient accuracy to protect the world's trading system from abuse by uh, by unscrupulous governments that use this as a way to uh, introduce protectionism, uh, pure pure and simple. So and I think what I was saying at the beginning that. You know, views have changed on on carbon border adjustment. I would say that ten years ago, that was probably the conventional wisdom: was that we don't, the world doesn't want carbon border adjustment because it will just become protectionism. And I think that's changing, at least to the extent of saying, "Well, um, we really need we're we're in such deep trouble that we really need to try it." Which I think is probably the message the EU is trying to trying to send. Thank you so much for the explanation. No, thank you. I, thank I really like the idea. And uh, I, I also agree that although there might be some loopholes and partial failures, yeah. but at least I think it's worthwhile trying first and try to see what would happen. Right. And right. we can uh, adjust or improve the, the mechanism right. so that uh, it can be a better yeah. uh, progress <laughs> in terms of well climate said. policy. Yep. Well said. Good. Very nice. Thank you so thank much. You. Thanks for the comments. Okay, well, nice to wrap up on that somewhat optimistic note. So, What's it? Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, thank you, Michael, for the very uh, interesting and important uh, <laughs> conversation. And uh, thank you all for joining. I uh, hope you'll hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.